Okay, the H1B guy here, and today the H1B guy live, stamp it out, nine Q&A on immigration journey, mental health, immigration reform, and more. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already, to please subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube and like this video so that I can continue to produce more content like this for you. I also wanted to mention the H1B Guy offers a variety of consulting services. I help businesses and individuals solve complex work authorization issues in the recruitment process while bringing awareness to employment-based immigration benefits. If I can help you, please reach out. I'd love to hear how. Today's live stream is brought to you by RecruiterNetworks.com, the smart solution for digital perm ads since 2001. And also by Path to Canada, the ideal plan B for high-skilled immigrants currently in the U.S. whose status may be uncertain. If you're facing an H-1B denial or OPT expiration, don't get caught off guard. Make sure you have a plan B, and Path to Canada is the answer. So today, I have the privilege to introduce to you Dr. G. I think like all the guests that I've had the opportunity to interview during the Stamp It Out appointments, you will find Dr. G extremely intelligent, thoughtful, compassionate, and honestly, just as tough as they come. Her 2020, very much like mine, led her down a path of finding her true calling. She's also helping others and has never felt more fulfilled in her career. So without any further delay, Dr. G, how you doing today? I'm well. I'm super excited about being here uh, with you. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's just such an honor to be uh, in conversation with you. Well, I'm so glad to have you on and really excited uh, to have others hear your story. Um, but wanted to just ask again to please like this video, subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube. But if you have any questions or comments for myself or Dr. G as part of this conversation here today, please post those in the chat and I will do my best to get to them. But wanted to just jump right in, Dr. G, and, and get right to it with the first question we always ask here on the Stamp It Out, which is, tell me your story. Where are you originally from and why did you come to the US? Um, yeah, so I'm originally from Bombay, towards the western part of uh, India, so from a state called Maharashtra. And uh, I was studying uh, psychology, um, and I, uh, on really my parents' encouragement, decided to consider doing my PhD in the United States so that I could really advance in my career. I was involved in mental health advocacy and I realized that a PhD would actually equip me to have uh, stronger conversations uh, in the mental health uh, arena in India. So when I came across this field of community psychology um, and re realized that there were programs in the United States that would give me uh, both community psychology as well as clinical psychology training in like one program, I decided to, you know, consider applying for a PhD. I happened to get in touch with this amazing uh, professor who was like, was extremely encouraging. She told me about other programs in the United States that would be a good fit as well. I eventually, of course, ended up going to the program where she was um, and uh, moved to the United States in 2007 to attend graduate school. Uh, absolutely certain that I would finish my PhD and return to India to develop like mental health programs in India mm -hmm. and just continue my career uh, as a mental health professional contributing to communities everywhere. That had been the plan. You know, that's interesting because you came here to be U.S. educated with kind of the the, the thought process or the end goal to, to go back, right? I think that's kind of an uncommon theme, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And my parents hoped I would change my mind uh, because uh, they really, they, they had seen me working as a mental health professional in India and this was before 2007. So I think they were just concerned that I wouldn't get the career satisfaction that I was uh, looking for. Mm -hmm. So they kept discouraging me uh, from returning to India. Uh, so yeah, I know it's an uncommon path. 
Food and yet up. here you still are, right? So yeah. that, that that leads into the, the next question, which is, you know, if, if you could go back and and give yourself one piece mm -hmm. of advice, you know, before you got on the plane to come to the US, what, what would that advice be? Yeah, you know, Robert, you uh, had asked me this question before. And I remembered even then thinking like this question, how I answer it changes every few months. Um, I, I've discussed this with you. Uh, I uh, My H4 EAD expired in September 2020. And I remember in the build up to that, I had just so much frustration. And I was just like, you know, if there's some advice I could give myself, I would tell myself, like, make sure you go back. Uh, just mm -hmm. like you said, but um, I think what I would, the advice I would give myself now that I think about it is one is uh, be prepared for the possibility that the career satisfaction that you're looking for, you might end up finding it in the United States. And when your goal is to actually serve people and their mental health, you might discover that you will just start doing that. So be prepared for the possibility that you'll fall in love with your career in the United States. I hadn't, I think I had not imagined or I hadn't accounted for that. Um, and I think the second advice I would probably give myself is be a little more knowledgeable about uh, the immigration scene for Indian immigrants, because I hadn't really been pay paying attention to that because I was prepared to return to India. So I wasn't really, really trapped a lot of things look at the immigration uh, movements that uh, are uh, you know especially advocating for high skilled immigrants i re realized so much of that was happening while i was uh, you know busy with graduate school advocating for different communities i just mm -hmm. never realized that the indian immigrant community uh, also needed support of Indian immigrants. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one advice I'd give myself, like, hey, kind of stay in touch with what's happening to the Indian mm -hmm. immigrants in the United States. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, a common theme for parents of documented dreamers as well, you know, mm -hmm. not to, to, to take that down a different path. But I think that oh. theme of being educated on what yeah. the laws are before you come yeah. or before you decide to stay. And I think mm -hmm. the reason that, you know, a lot of individuals aren't Indians or otherwise um, is that there is this allure of the U.S. as the number yeah. one destination country in, in the world and the yeah. opportunity that you seek. And, and you said it, you know, you you get it to this um, kind of part where you're like, wow, I've found my career and you don't want to yeah. leave that. And I think that's a struggle for a lot of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, uh, it's a struggle and it's a very painful, uh, it's a very painful experience to think you're just leading your life and you think you're doing good work. You're contributing to people because no matter what work each of us do, whether we are working in a, uh, setting up banking systems or we are setting up, uh, shopping orders or we are mm -hmm. serving our lines as doctors nurses i think all of us do such important work everybody in in the united states does important work and i think when you suddenly realize that that's not enough mm -hmm. that there is like some paperwork that determines even if you followed every law done checked every box and you've done everything that you were supposed to do to think that that's not enough mm -hmm that's painful that i'm just leading my life and i'm just contributing to other people the best i can and uh, yeah so i think sometimes the paperwork tells you that's not enough yeah and and i think that that's the cycle that we talk about right that it's mm -hmm. it's a continual circle and and it doesn't end you don't you don't get off there isn't a, an off ramp mm -hmm. on the interstate it just continues to to spin <laughs> And I think yeah. that's the one thing that a lot of high skilled immigrants and, and just even immigrants in general that come to the U.S. Right. that, that you know, H2s that, that come to the U.S. searching agriculture, they don't they don't yeah. really understand what what the full ramifications are um, in terms of, of 
their finite period of time here. And so yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's very interesting, right? I mean, to, to, to think about what that cycle is like for individuals who have been here 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years now, um, because mm -hmm. that, that, that number is, is growing. And, you know, I alluded to at the, the top of, of the, the conversation and in the introduction that, you know, you very much like me had this pivot and you mentioned it, you know, around September 2020. Um, mm -hmm. And and that pivot was that, you know, you created a, a podcast called Wellness Minutes. And yeah. and that can be found on anchor.fm slash five wellness minutes. And I'll post that in the chat so that everyone can see that. But again, it's anchor.fm uh, slash forward slash five wellness minutes with an S on the end. And that overview reads, quote, in a world full of demands and stressors, especially while living in limbo, what good can come possibly from rest? Come find out. Accept this invitation to take a deep breath, ground yourself into the present moment and learn different coping skills to not only survive, but thrive despite stress. Designed by a psychologist in the green card backlog in the U.S., this podcast is designed by and for people who know a thing or two about limbos. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, how and why did you create the Wellness Minutes podcast? Yeah, I, I love this question so much. Um, so uh, I had like before moving to the US, I had I'd mentioned that I was involved in mental health advocacy. It was really, you know, encouraging folks to think about their mental health and also think about different ways of achieving mental health. Like a lot of times I think mental health is not discussed enough in our communities, like in a lot of communities, South Asian communities in general, mental health is not discussed enough. And there's also this assumption of, oh, you need psych psychotherapy because you're crazy or you know, or you have like some serious illness. And I don't think it's like that. I mean, I think we all need some support. Sometimes we need somebody outside us to show us like what to serve as a mirror reflection of what's, mm -hmm. you know, what you're sharing tells me that you're, you're experiencing stress about this. And it seems like these two things are connected. So just that mental health conversation wasn't necessarily happening. Uh, the last few years, ever since I graduated and I started working, I got really busy and I didn't really get a chance to continue my mental health advocacy outside my job where I was serving as mm -hmm. a parent in different communities. Um, when I started preparing uh, for, for the fact that my uh, H4 EAD was expiring. Um, I had meanwhile in the last three years been advocating for uh, fairness in employment based immigration laws so that these, uh, you know, the reason that the H4 EAD was developed was essentially to, you know, it was like a stopgap arrangement while uh, the fairness and uh, immigration laws was, you know, was being implemented. So I had been advocating for fairness. And again, like I was noticing that there was just so much mental health stuff that was coming up for people. There was just so much stress, so much anxiety, so much just sadness because, you know, you all, when we come with dreams and then those dreams turn into nightmares, mm -hmm. of course, have a human reaction to that so I would keep noticing that and I would now and then like you know just if I could offer support to folks I was you know just very casually letting folks know that you know mental health options are out there like let me let me tell you how you can get in touch mm -hmm. so my H4 EAD expired I spent like a week or two in in bed just like you know like how how am I why is this happening mm -hmm. um, even depressed, though I was, right I mean I would call that depression right yeah I mean and I was definitely um there was just this sense of it's not fair that we are having to go through this uh due to like our country of birth that mm -hmm. per country limits have put us in this backlog it's reduced our freedom it's reduced it's done so much to us and then suddenly I was also recognizing that despite all the work I was doing, I eventually my EAD was still gone. 
And it didn't matter that my boss wrote on my behalf and said that, you know, students who rely on mental health services would lose their therapist. Like none of that mattered. So I was, you know, I was going through this period and then suddenly the there was some conversations going on because, you know, way in October, the visa bulletin had moved and there was a mm -hmm. lot of, of activity. And I saw how that flurry was affecting people that there was just this the window is open we need to do something we need to like get our EADs at least and on the other hand there were people who missed that boat too because you know again the accident of when was your priority date mm -hmm. and and so it was just painful and I remembered a friend of mine Ram happening to say something in conversation where he just said you know I think I understand why so many Indian immigrants in the backlog have died in the last few years there's just so much stress in our communities immigration is the first thing we think of in the morning and the last mm -hmm. thing we think of at night and that just like hit me it just hit me because i had been grieving for all the people whose gofundmes i had contributed to mm -hmm. and i was thinking like this is just crazy our people are literally dying in the backlog and i'm watching this again and again these gofundmes people who seemed healthy and then just died suddenly and i as a therapist i'm very aware of an important role that our psychological health plays on our physical health. Like it could be something as basic as I'm too stressed out to eat. Mm -hmm. I'm too stressed out to sleep. I'm too stressed out to notice that this pain in my stomach isn't going away. So people delay going to the doctor. Like, you know, there's just so many ways in which stress contributes. So I think when my friend Ram just happened to say that, I was like, Gidiga, this is this this is it. This is it. You uh this is your moment. Um, treat this period as a sabbatical that the USCIS has awarded you mm -hmm. and do the work that you have wanted to do for a long time. It's work that, you know, of course, doesn't get paid because, you know, who's who's going to like whatever. So I was just like, OK, this is a great opportunity to um, use this time to do what I know to do, which is share um, mental health knowledge. Mm -hmm. And somewhere I think mentioning that look i am in the backlog too was to let folks know that hey you know i know a little bit about what i'm talking about and i know also about how tough it is to do this i'm not going to pretend like oh just breathe you know you can just like get over stress if you just breathe no i know it's hard i know mm -hmm. rest is hard i know these thoughts that run like a thousand miles a minute i know it's hard i am in that moment very often mm -hmm. but i've also learned that that's that isn't the only way to be I learned to find I mean you know of course I had those two weeks of being extremely depressed after my H4 AD expired but I know that that's not that's not my whole life there is so much else happening in my life that gives me joy and on days that I'm no matter what like I have something that I'm grateful for and I realize that that's helpful my world isn't just that piece of paper that tells me I have my green card or I have my EAD or whatever else, that there is so much more. So if we could tap into our mental health, we would actually recognize those different uh, other things in our life that coexist mm -hmm. with our immigration stress. So I think some of the goal was really to get folks to recognize that immigration stress is real, sorting that out is real, but that doesn't have to be the only thing. There is place for wellness. Mm -hmm. So the podcast was born out of that. And for the five minutes was so that nobody could say it, it takes too long to listen to this podcast. Like, yeah, yeah, I love it because, you know, I, um, my, my friend uh, Deepu Asak, who was on the Stamp It Out 6, was mm -hmm. the one who had um, suggested that that I do some audio only stuff on Anchor.fm, and and uh, you know it, they they make it fairly easy um, to 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 do in terms of self recording or recording directly through their their system. Um, but yeah, so I shared it again. It's, it's Anchor.fm forward slash five the the word five wellness minutes with an s on the end um so i wanted to just ask those of you who are out there who are currently watching you know like um this video if you have any questions uh, for dr g any mental health related questions 
Um, it, it, make sure you post those, or if you have comments, post those in the chat. Um, Pri, I see you've got a question around I-485 processing. Um, I'd really like to keep the conversation focused here today with Dr. G on, on mental, mental health and, and wellness for those individuals in the green card backlog. Um, but you can reach out to me directly. I'd love to help you. Um, you can find me and contact me through the h1bguy.com. Um, or if you follow me on Twitter, please feel free to message me there. Um, so I wanted to kind of dive in a little further into the wellness minutes and, mm. and talk about why five minutes specifically, because if you go and look at your content, a lot of it is, is less than six minutes, a little over five, but, but less than and six. So why are five minutes of, of really good deep breath, right? So important, right. not only for individuals in the green card backlog, but, but I think for everyone right now, there is just this whole heightened sense of, of angst among everyone. And, and I had a moment a few weeks ago, um, you know, where I was just mentally exhausted too. And, and you have to rest, right? It just, it happens. Um, for me, it was, it was an afternoon, but, but why is even just five minutes so important? Absolutely. Um, I chose five minutes mainly because uh, it was quick. You can tell yourself you have, you know, you, this will take you only five minutes. And uh, the importance of taking a deep breath, uh, besides having an episode in which I've talked about like the brain science of uh, just the positive impact of breathing. Um, the thing is that we um, typically are in a place of constantly reacting to the world. There's things, there are things going on around us all the time, especially as human beings. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, you know, the joke is we are less human being, we're more human doing. We're constantly reacting to stuff that's happening around us. And there's just so many demands on our attention, on our time, there are expectations uh, that come from the different roles we play in our life, uh, whether at work or at home. So there's just constant demands being placed on us. So the part of the brain that's constantly reacting is also mm -hmm. the part of the brain that experiences stress, that sends mm -hmm. all the stress reactions throughout the body. Your mm -hmm. heart rate is elevating and you have sometimes, you know, your muscles tense up. It's all in line with helping the body fight, flight or freeze. You know, it's mm -hmm. constantly reacting to stress. However, on the other side, the part of the brain that helps you rest and digest is the part that helps you sleep, it helps you digest your food, and it sort of just helps you take care of yourself. That mm. part of the brain is almost like it doesn't get its moment in the sun because it's the, you know, the stress reacting part is constantly doing stuff. Mm. The restful part is waiting for the stress reaction to stop so it can show up because it's like okay can can i can i come now okay no looks like you're still busy okay can i come now okay no you're still busy so when we actually start breathing and very consciously uh stepping back and taking a deep breath that's the simplest way we are helping the resting and digesting part of the brain get activated mm. so each time you practice that more and more it's almost like you're strengthening the uh, mm. that otherwise is waiting for some stress to stop. But you are now teaching it that, hey, I am going to manually breathe so that the stress can actually take a backseat for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to strengthen the part of my brain that helps me rest and digest. Mm. And the whole idea is, uh, you know, and of course, you know, right now, everyone's stressed out. <laughs> of course, not just folks with the green card backlog. Mm. Our brain is on fire because it's, it's actually fighting an invisible enemy. Mm. Like, it's out there. The pandemic, the virus is out there. Everything you do is like colored with pandemic. You know, it's like, are you going for a walk? Have you worn your mask? Have you done this? Have you done that? Like everything is fighting the virus. So the stress reaction part of the brain is like, it's on fire. So it becomes all the more important that we take a deep breath so that we are activating the part of the brain that will help us rest and digest. And I think importantly also like, um, there is this very famous quote by a psychologist who had actually survived the Holocaust, uh, Viktor Frankl. He has this beautiful book called Man's Search for Meaning, where he talks about, and I'm paraphrasing, that 
between uh, stress and response, there is a space. So if you know, if you just put your fingers together, one is stress, one is response, and you know, we are constantly thinking and acting at the same time. Mm-hmm. But if we're creating a space between our thoughts and our actions, we can actually choose actions instead of functioning like machines, where you press a button and then you perform. Let's actually spread out the space between our thoughts and our actions so that mm. we're not we just reacting. We are choosing an action. We are mm-hmm. also choosing how we'll respond to something. And it doesn't have to be just what naturally keeps arising sometimes. Of course, acknowledge what's naturally arising. Stress is real. I'm not saying pretend there's no stress. Mm-hmm. There is something else you can do with it. It doesn't always have to end with, I'm stressed out and this is the end of the story. No. Can be, I'm stressed out. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to step back. I'm going to mm-hmm. rest five minutes. And the podcast is to give your mind something to do because our mind's constantly running around looking for things. So it's like, okay, here, listen to this podcast for five minutes. This is your pause. And maybe this will give you some ideas and maybe go practice that. So that's the yes, It's kind of like headspace in a podcast almost. <laughs> You know, for for back backlogged uh, immigrants uh, and immigrants in the green card backlog, I guess I, guess right. I should say. And you everybody, know, it, if you hear the content, it's it's technically for everybody, but I'm just calling out you, the folks in the backlog. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting too because you know you talk about the activity, and mm-hmm. you know now with the way technology is and right. how everything has moved and advanced so quickly. Um, one of my good friends and I, uh, a week and a half ago or so on, on Good Friday, we're, we're having a conversation and we were just talking about how quickly technology has evolved, it, you know, right. from when we were in high school, my friend and I, and, and we had bag phones. And now you look at what, you know, iPhones can do. And, and then we started, you know, debating about what, what, What's going to be the one thing that people are going to be trying to determine in in 20 years? And and I think that that's going to be a difference between what is real and what is augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And the way things are being fed to us, Mm -hmm. you know, repeatedly over and over and over the cycle, right, of of information and at our fingertips and our ability to, um, you know, fuel the fire and then continue to throw gas on it. Right. And what that does to us mentally and emotionally, physically, even um, it's, it's, it's very interesting how I think, you know, there's this old cliche statement, you know, things were better back when, right. You know, the more simpler time. Uh, But I also go and, and look at what automation and technology in general has driven and then you apply that to its impact on mental health yeah, and, and how that's increased a lot of issues for a lot of individuals. And then you alluded to the, the, the COVID cycle, right? right. And, and, you know, for me back in March, I was afraid to go outside of my house because that's what we had been led to believe. Right. And, and I believed it and, and I'm, and, and not saying that it's not real because the numbers prove that. Um, but it also proves that with caution and intentional yeah. behavior, right? Because I think that's yeah. what it comes down to. You said choice uh, several times, you know, yeah. I, uh, intentional behavior, um, right. ultimately is, is for us. When you look at what wellness minutes does, it's five minutes of intentional behavior. It's a reset. Um, and so that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, when, when you and I were connected and, and I listened to some of what you're doing, I just was, um, you know, very excited about, about this. And, and I thought it was really cool and, and really unique. And so, you know, you and I talked about a lot of different things, um, right. but I wanted to turn the conversation now um, to, you know, advocacy and mm-hmm. and reform, right? We yeah. we always want to talk about this and in, in the stamp it out uh, appointments. And so, you know, you you mentioned something to me that uh, you know I, I call you a a self proclaimed bipartisan immigration activist, mm-hmm. right? So say that several times fast, but you know, bipartisan immigration activist is is yeah. I think a, a very interesting term, and. Really? 
I, I do because I think when we look at how are things going to change as it relates mm -hmm. to um, reform that's mutually beneficial. Right. Not just not just for the individual, not just for the me's, right? Because it's mm -hmm. much bigger than the me's. It just oh. is. We have to look past the me. And we have to look at like, you know, a little further down the road around future generations and 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 what that impact is. But I wanted to give you a chance to yeah. um, to define what this means to you, bipartisan immigration activists. What do you mean by yeah. that statement? Yeah, no, uh, Robert, I appreciate the way you've laid down this, laid out this question as well. I mean, there's just so much that, you know, you're alluding to, like that it's bigger than individuals. It's it's about something bigger and it's about future generations too. Like will uh, whatever I'm doing today is going to have an impact, a radiating impact on something much bigger than me, something beyond my lifetime. So uh, so bipartisan immigration um, activism. Um, so in a nutshell, immigration definitely inflames a lot of passion on both sides of the aisle for both Democrats and Republicans. Absolutely. Uh, nobody's neutral on immigration. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a point of view about immigration. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality of the matter is that no one side has enough votes to just pass an immigration bill without considering the other side. They have to work together in order to uh, achieve any kind of immigration movement. So as a bipartisan immigration activist, what I keep my eye on is that uh, the Democrats and Republicans both represent American voters and they both have certain points of view and they both have to find, uh, and we as uh, as people who are inf uh, impacted by immigration policy, have to find a way to advocate with Democrats and Republicans by sharing our stories, by appealing to their, uh, you know, their everyone's better human nature. Because I mm -hmm. know politics does something, and of course they are all human beings who are in politics. So it's appealing to their better human nature by also rec uh, getting them to see the impact of immigration laws. Plus, it, the, and any immigrant entering any country, so all of us who've entered the United States, there is this reciprocal relationship, of course, that we have with our new homes. Mm -hmm. We contribute and this new home uh, impacts us. So, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of time recognizing the different ways in which we have to advocate for ourselves and mm -hmm. share our stories with people who are on both sides of the aisle so that they can actually recognize uh, the impact of good immigration laws uh, on America in general. And a very concrete way in which um, I function as a bipartisan activist is by advocating for pro-immigrant laws, mm -hmm. not immigration laws. I'm frequently surprised by a lot of immigration activists I've met who actually don't notice the difference till I point it out to them. That I'm like, you know, everyone talks about, yeah, 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 you know, like absolutely immigrants should have a right to move to the US. And I'm like, but have you thought about the rights of immigrants as human rights and the rights of people to be free? And when people come to the United States, without rights on an employment based immigration system in an employment based immigration system like on an h1b visa and mm -hmm. then their green cards they if they don't have rights then they become employees with few fewer rights and mm -hmm. then they risk they end up being used to perpetuate like maybe a toxic work culture when mm -hmm. immigrants are reliant on their employers for their life in the United States, they are less likely to complain about exploitative working conditions. Mm -hmm. So they are being beneficial, not because they're smarter, not because they are, you know, any special skill. It There is the risk of them being valuable because they're easier to exploit and they will uphold an exploitative system. So bad employers take advantage of immigrants with fewer rights, and then use them to edge out U.S. workers, U.S. workers who have very well-fought labor rights, mm -hmm. which immigrants without rights can actually not benefit from. So 
a poor immigration, employment-based immigration system is not good for anybody. It's not good for immigrants. It's not good for American workers. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times that little detail, I, I was surprised that it wasn't known. I, of course, learned a lot about it from just being in the movement for fairness. Mm -hmm. So much about the the complexity of the immigration question and the importance of seeing this as a human rights issue. And when immigrants with fewer rights are used to displace foreign workers, that's not good for anybody. And I think when you speak to both sides of the aisle about the importance of pro-immigrant laws for both immigrants as, as well as American workers, it ends up really appealing to mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans. And I think I've seen a lot of a lot of my faith in bipartisan immigration work really has been enhanced by seeing just how the fairness bill has like it, with every Congress that it's been introduced, mm -hmm. it's only gone higher and higher in terms of its popularity. And the fact that this was the only immigration bill in the history of the United States to pass with 100 se senators agreeing on it, passing an immigration bill by unanimous consent, a 38 page bill, an immigration bill by unanimous consent is historic. And mm -hmm. it's to the importance of doing bipartisan work. I think a lot of times there is the risk of folks assuming that only some people care about immigration. The fact is that everybody cares about America. And we as immigrants who live here, work here, we care about America. So how do we ensure that we are speaking to all those other people who've been elected by our American citizen mm -hmm. things? So how do we actually appeal to all of them and let folks know that, hey, this is good for America. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of my bipartisan work has really been about just recognizing um, the priorities of both sides of the aisle and appealing to them. Um, yeah. Those, those priorities. There, there's yeah. so much to unpack there because I think you you hit on a, a ton of points and and all, I'm gonna kind of try to peel them back as <laughs> as I can, which is you talked about. Um, you know, the whistleblower rule, which is, you, you didn't refer to it, but you were alluding to it, um, which is protections for employees for, um, you know, poor working conditions, right? right. Uh, specifically H-1Bs. Uh, I think also too, you know, one of the biggest um, uh, negative uh that we hear around H-1Bs is always, hey, you know, displacement of U.S. workers, right? That's that's one side of the aisle. The other right. side of the aisle for the high-skilled immigrant is the use of the term indentured servitude, which is yeah. mo mo modern-day slavery, right? Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. I've talked about this a lot, which is once you have an employer that holds your H-1B, your choices are fairly limited, you yep. can change employers, but you've got to find an employer that you trust that's going to file a change of employer that has a real job opportunity for you. Um, that You have that choice, but that's really about it. And I talked about this earlier in the week with the electronic filing uh, for the H-1B lottery. And that is, you know, if, if individuals had their, their cases selected multiple times, different employers, they have to pick one before that physical petition is submitted. And that's one of the few times that, that they actually have a choice. And what it really comes down to is it's a it's a lack of freedom. And, and you talked about human rights crisis earlier. Uh, I, I think it, it comes down to there's no freedom to, to, to choose. Uh, choose yeah. who you work for, um, how much you're paid. To a certain extent, there are some some liberties there, um, but ultimately there is a, a lack of freedom. And I'm an H-1B advocate because right. from a staffing perspective, what I understand is that IT unemployment right now is less than 4%. There were over a million computer occupation jobs open in February of 2021 on job portal postings. Some of right. those are probably duplicates by multiple staffing firms posting the same job. But regardless, you're still talking about a very significant number. So where is, you were talking about gaps earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. And the gap is that we don't have enough high-skilled U.S. educated. While there are several 
kids that are graduating every year with bachelor's in computer science degrees, their right. ability to write code is, is not something that, that they do. While they may be technical, they're not writing enterprise level, uh, you know, siloed Java code. They're just not. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is an H1B. It just is. And any of my sure. recruiter friends or my staffing friends out there who are watching this would agree with me 100% on that, that there right. are roles that they have in their job orders right now that the only way they're going to fill that role is with an H-1B visa. And so mm -hmm. it all comes back to me. You talk about, you know, bipartisan immigration activism. And yeah. one of the things I've talked about from the very beginning on this channel is a merit-based points immigration system. And to oh. me, that that becomes kind of the answer to the freedom, right? Yeah. You, you bring people into the U.S. based on their merit and skill. Where my good friend Christine Mikulajuk had the famous statement here on a Stamp It Out interview where she said, the worst way to come to the U.S. is based on merit and skill. <laughs> Think about that. The, yeah. the, that is ultimately to me why we have a problem and mm -hmm. the problem has to be addressed because right now there are individuals that are here in this backlog that are telling future generations don't come to the U.S. consider somewhere right. else. So guess what? We're losing that war on human capital. We're losing that war on the best and the brightest because COVID accelerated this mm -hmm. digital borderless society that, that we live and work in. So mm. I wanted to ask you, because we've been talking about reform a lot, we've alluded to the, the Fairness for High-Skilled Immigrants Act, um, right. but do you think that there is a possibility for employment-based immigration reform, uh, reform addressing the green card backlog in, mm -hmm. in 2021? Do you think this is something that we'll see happen? Uh, in Congress before the end of the year? Do, do you have hope, faith in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think so. You know, I mean, I'll acknowledge I'm not an astrologer, so I don't see the future. But I also yeah. know that history often tells you a bit about what you can expect. There are a few things that we have recognized that things don't happen because they magically appear. Things yep. happen because people make them happen. We have to continue advocating for our uh, our for the changes that we want, and we need to also ensure that we don't become pawns, political pawns, on for either side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. We need to stay focused on what we need, and uh, you know, I mean, following through with stuff that has worked and stuff that has already traction. Uh, the fairness bill, of course, will get introduced at, I mean, it, just history has shown us that it will get introduced in every Congress. However, it is also our work as uh, immigrants in the backlog to continue to make sure that we have our voices be heard so that we put that requisite amount of uh, pressure on folks to know that this matters this issue is important and just like you know you were referring to the fact that uh, high skilled immigrants are fulfilling some important labor gaps because you know like you were saying that there aren't as many folks coming out of uh, schools uh, american citizens and american kids coming out of schools who could do those jobs. That's absolutely, that's 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 one reality too. And at the same time, when um, people have been in the backlog for this long, they continue to just, you know, they've been vetted time and again mm -hmm. as being people who are fulfilling those labor gaps. Mm -hmm. So there is no risk of them being the ones who are displacing American workers. It has right. been established that they are not and the green card uh, you, i mean I, i'm sure you know about that and i'm sure your listeners do too but the process is so exhaustive it's to make sure that a bad employer is not taking advantage of uh, an immigrant with fewer rights the indentured servitude created by the backlog is not the employer's fault it's the the way the system works so i think somewhere ensuring that this is this issue continues to be brought to the forefront and mm -hmm. we continue to advocate in very focused ways i think a lot of times when we become political pawns for either side we end up assuming that 
and I think there's also like a lot of divisions that are then created in the community where some folks are fighting for this one thing, some folks are fighting for another. I think it's important to recognize that a bill that has been successful is likely to continue to build on its success. Mm -hmm. Change is not like a binary thing that you're either successful one day or you're not. Change is a curvilinear process. It's an mm -hmm. upward moving spiral. We keep moving mm -hmm. up, we dip. And then we move up again. We never go as far below as we did before. Mm -hmm. We move up. Like even when the fairness bill had passed, you know, when it was 392, like two Congresses ago, I remember when we came back into Congress, we came back with a bang. Like we had these historic number of original co-sponsors. And I remember so many members of Congress is talking about like, of course, you're just going to build up from where you left off. And that that is the important thing to remember. So I believe that absolutely, I don't think we have the luxury of despair. We have lived here and served in the United States. And it's like that, you know, that President JFK's old saying that don't ask what America can do for you, ask what you can do for America. And I think mm -hmm. as immigrants in the backlog, I think we've answered that question like a million times. Mm -hmm. And I continue to do that. Immigration mm -hmm. reform, working towards like a very focused, successful bill, the Fairness for High Skilled Immigrants Act is the one that I have continued to advocate for because I think mm -hmm. it does exactly that. So I do have a lot of faith that folks will continue to uh, have their voices be heard and that this bill will of course get introduced and i think uh, an important thing that i often want people to and this is me coming from it, coming at it as a mental health professional too um speaking also from my own mental health experiences that there is despair that comes there's despair depression and, and feelings of helplessness that come from being in situations like these you know like our immigration limbo we can't mm -hmm. change the country of birth we can't Advocacy is something that's good for you. It mm -hmm. reminds you that you're not as helpless as you think you are. Mm -hmm. There is more you can do uh, in this particular situation and having your voices be heard by members of Congress and absolutely building community with other people so that everybody is working in the same direction is overall mm -hmm. good for sense of community and it's good for America. And I think overall it's good for immigration reform as well. Yeah, I mean, you you hit on it, and I think that's been kind of a common theme that I've read in terms of some attacks that I've I've seen out there, which is, you know, you've got H four EADs doing their own thing, you've got frontline healthcare workers doing their own thing, you have high, high IT professionals in the backlog doing their own thing, and there's a lot of division sort of amongst that. Whereas, like, hey, you know, little bit at a time. Right. Be unified and mm -hmm. that you're all immigrants here fighting for immigration reform for again, it goes back to it's not just about me. Uh, right. it's, it, it's about it's about the change for the better for the future. And I, I think that, you know, I, I'm glad you're hopeful because we're seeing a lot. I mean, we saw the day one U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, um, which, you know, still yet to be on the floor, but has been introduced. Um, we saw the the Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act resurface. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen, uh, in, and you and I joked about this earlier, but before we came on, uh, S970 um, from uh, the distinguished senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul, um, that looks to increase green card allotment to reduce uh, the green card backlog. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so you're seeing a lot of these standalones start to pop up when day one, mm -hmm. there was an immigration comprehensive reform uh, bill that, that, that came out. And so right. that to me, and, and then you've got the, the dreamers, right? Documented right. and undocumented. Um, so right. you got a lot of different things that are happening right now in this country. Is mm -hmm. it really, to immigration reform. And a lot of people say, oh, they've divided us and that's exactly what they wanted. I think the problem is, is that we go back to a lot of these laws were written and based on uh, 1990 um, and, mm. and very little has changed, you know, over right. the last 31 years. And, and both country limits were from 1965. I mean, mm -hmm. so much has changed since 1965. Right. right. So I but you know, you mentioned like the the 
the list of bills that have come out i absolutely as some as uh, again uh, you know bipartisan immigration activist here yeah it's so important to see bills in terms of how much bipartisan buy in is there how many co sponsors are really there just the introduction right. of the bill doesn't mean the bill is becoming anything like, right oh, I'm like I'll be getting calls from like my parents saying, "Hey, we saw about this bill." Yeah. You know, and, and I have to like remind them like, "Okay, you know, this bill is is uh, is a north star." <laughs> but yeah. The bill that has actually passed the house mm -hmm. and the senate was the fairness bill. And right. we continue to like, you know, just like Indian immigrants know about intricacies of the employment-based immigration system in a way that very few people know because we've just been in the backlog for so long. Right. I think I have learned so much about Congress that a lot of citizen friends of mine actually don't know that oh wait it's possible for a bill to pass the house and the senate and still not pass yeah like, we joke the about it all the time on this channel yeah. and, and and it's credited yeah. to william hahn on on vox and his article that that he wrote where he says most mm -hmm. americans think that high skilled immigrants go to the dmv to get their working uh, authorization documents right and yeah. i can tell you that i have a lot of friends in my inner circle who are big supporters of what i do because of that they're they're my friends and they support me and they always come back to me through these interviews and through some things yeah. that I talk about and they say, I had no idea. I, yeah. I had, I'm not aware of this because it's, it's, it's Absolutely. out of sight and, and out of mind. But yeah. you, know, you and I were, were introduced by my good friend, Maddie, who was on the stamp it out one right. with his wife, Shakti. And Maddie is a listener of the wellness minutes podcast. And, you know, he had reached out to me and, and said, Hey, I have somebody I want to connect you to and, and kind of vice versa with, with you. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, when, when he reached out, what is it that, that motivated you to come on uh, with me here on the H one B guy channel and to tell your story? Yeah, I think I was uh, motivated on multiple fronts. One was, of course, I um, I could see the work you were doing and the impact you, uh, I think the reach you had, like folks were listening to you. And I, I appreciated you as an ally. Like I could, I think there was this one episode of yours where you just outright said, this is not an immigration issue, it's a human rights issue. And I was like, I, I don't even talk to this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He used that phrase. So mm. I think there was just something about uh, the way you were approaching the the humanity of the employment based immigration system that I really appreciated that you were doing both things that, of course, you're talking about the technicalities of employment based immigration, what's the adjustment of status, educating people about that. But you were also doing it from this really human angle, rep reminding folks that immigrant labor is not just capital. They're people with families, right. and when folks it's both. I, I hate to say it like that, but it 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 is both. It is, of course, of course, it is both. And I think a lot of times the the human side ends up being lost. So I think uh, somewhere I had I appreciated the fact that there was someone who cared about uh, both the human side as well as you know the reality of labor capital and all of that. So, um, and also since my podcast was somewhere, I really, at the, at the end of the day, a good idea is only as good as um, it helps people. And I was just like, okay, if I could speak about, of course, mental health, and also speak about how our mental health and our immigration work is related. And mm -hmm. when we talk about and we discuss immigration reform, it's important that we also recognize the our own role in that. You know, as immigrants, we don't have a vote, but we do have a voice. And I think that's the beauty of US democracy, that both mm -hmm. sides of the aisle listen. So, of course, things work at a pace that is, you know, human change, civilization change pace, mm -hmm. but our voice matters. So I think somewhere I was excited about the option if, you know, and of course, you know, it was, I was really happy that Maddie introduced us. And I also had this sense of like, you know, if this, if this flows with what Robert is also trying to do with the show, this is, this is great. If that could happen, that'll be awesome. So I think that's one reason I wanted to come on the show to, you know, just um, spread the word about mental health and our own role in immigration reform. And and that's exactly why I wanted to have you on because I, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot. Um, 
I enjoy it. I, I get a lot of positive out of Twitter, but there's a lot mm -hmm. of angry, high-skilled immigrants on Twitter. Yeah. And, and, and that's what's the beauty of it, too, right? Is that you can be, you can be expressive in that sense. Yeah. And so I, I advise anyone who's watching this um, who hasn't checked it out, uh, again, it, it's, it's anchor.fm uh, forward slash the, the word five wellness minutes with an S on the end and subscribe to it and, and start listening, go to the beginning and work your way up there. There's a lot of content. There's a lot of episodes on there. Um, and maybe you need to start with uh, a two or three in, in one day, um, 15 minutes and work your way down to five. Um, but I think that, that, you know, that's why I wanted to have you on because your story parallels mine, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, you you found your calling, and and right. you know you 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 have this gratification that that comes from that, and you want to get the word out around it, and it's it's very important. And I think that you know it, one of the reasons I've caught a lot of flack from a lot of people is is because one, I advocate for H one Bs, but I also talk about the negative aspects of it too, okay. and and I talk about the good and bad. And, and as you said, I think that that's why when I look at um, you know my customers because that's what i consider my subscribers to be here on youtube is is they mm -hmm. are my customers um right. be because I i'm gonna be who i am with what my opinion is i'm gonna look at the right and the left and i'm gonna bridge that gap and give you my opinion and then you can do with that what you want because it's for entertainment mm -hmm. and personal use that's right. all it is. Everything I talk about here is non-legal opinions. I am not an immigration mm -hmm. attorney. I don't want to be. I don't want to play one on TV. Um, no <laughs> offense to them. I know some really good ones. And if you need one, I can connect you with, with one, right? Um, but yeah. if you need help and you need somebody that can break down and differentiate what's my employer saying, what's my immigration mm -hmm. attorney mm -hmm. saying, this is what I'm reading on the thousands of foreign pages that I've read help me make sense of this right and that's where the fear anxiety comes in and helping people right hoping to to give them some sort of peace of mind to say listen everything you've told me here this is what i think now right. you take that for how you want you form your own conclusions on it but just right. so glad to have you on i'm glad you wanted to come Thank on and I, I really appreciate maddie um creating this this Same. introduction for Shout us so Absolutely. So what's next for Dr. G? Oh, um, yeah, I think I think one thing that I definitely uh, wanted to put a plug for was uh, this other project that uh, another uh, psychologist who's also in the green card backlog and I are uh, we're doing this project to explore the mental health of folks in the green card backlog, where we are essentially hoping to interview people who are in the green card backlog, who have, you know, been through the process of being approved for their green cards, but are, you know, waiting. We want mm. to interview different people to actually do a mental health study to basically mm. understand the diverse, the, the mental health landscape of uh, being in the backlog. So we are working on that project right now. Uh, okay. To do any kind of human research, you need to have like ethics board review your mm -hmm. protocols and stuff. So we're doing that. But if folks are really interested in participating, uh, feel free to email uh, shared skies 2020 at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, we could uh, connect you to the survey that you'll need and, to fill out. And that's S-H-A-R-E-D. Yes. S-K-I-E-S, Shared Skies. Yes, Shared Skies 2020 at gmail.com. 2020 at, at gmail.com. All right, I'm going to pull it up on the screen just to make sure oh, that, thank it's, you. Thanks, that, Robert. that it's right here. Is that that's correct? Shared S H A R E D S K I E S twenty twenty at gmail dot com, and so yeah. that is a, uh, a a series of interviews that you're going to be doing for individuals that have been in the green card backlog that would be willing right. to speak to you uh, confidentially, of course, right. in terms of the impact on their overall mental health. So, correct. And, right. and if you do reach out, please, um, you know, if you do hit this email, sh uh, shared skies, 2020 at gmail.com. Uh, 
um, let them know that uh, that you found them through the H1B guy. So Dr. Yeah. G can, can give you some extra uh, love and care. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. That's true. You will yeah. get extra attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just want to, you know, like mention also that the name of this project came from just this reminder that the sky, sky has no borders. The sky is mm -hmm. limitless. And uh, every opportunity you get to look at your own limitlessness uh, is, you know, an, a moment well spent. So Shared Skies 2020 is both like an aspirational uh, yep. goal for everyone's mental health. And yes, and we're doing this research. So please reach out. And it's, of course, like uh, Robert said, it's confidential. Uh, your name won't be repeated or anything. And all identifying information will be removed. But your uh, stories will really help contribute to mental health research in the field because there is none. I mean, I, I, there are a few studies. I know Robert, you even covered. I yeah. Think, Shiv Kumar study. Yeah, the the UTC study, and then there is a mm -hmm. a, a friend, um, somebody who I've connected to from the University of Redlands in California, um, mm -hmm. and she's going to be doing something. She doesn't have it out yet, but uh, working yeah. on it. Um, so Beautiful. I will, uh, she actually, I, I need to follow up with her. She, she reached out to me last week while I was out of town and I'll be sharing that for her, um, through, you know, my social channels and everything for individuals who, who awesome. want to participate. So, yeah. um, just wanted to ask those of you out there, you know, like, uh, this video, if you haven't subscribed to the H1B guy channel here on YouTube, um, I know we've gotten some questions that have come in around, uh, uh, individualized questions. But if you have any questions for Dr. G around mental health through the Wellness Minutes podcast, uh, post those. Dr. G has a few questions for me. And then we'll um, I'll pull up some of the Q&A comments and questions that have come up. Uh, so Dr. G, I want to turn it over to you. I know you had a couple of questions that you wanted to ask me. Yeah. So, um, so there are two questions. One is, uh, what is some advice that you have based on whatever you have learned uh, by interacting with folks through H1B Guy? Uh, what is some advice that you have actually for employers mm -hmm. who use H1B system? Um, what is some advice that you have, maybe even feedback that you have to folks based on what you have recognized uh, yeah. in the immigrant community? So I recently did a presentation that I've alluded to on this channel a few times and on, on socials uh, for the COO forum here in Atlanta. And um, it, it, the presentation was around the value of the H-1B and how it's never been higher. Never in the history of the H-1B has the value of the H-1B ever been higher for employers and for individuals. The money's never been higher for individuals coming on H-1B. The exposure to the technology and the experience they get never been higher. Um, and for employers, the value's never been higher, right? Mm -hmm. the, the There are a lot of, of uh, research and analysis out there. I go as far as to say that H-1B employees create two jobs for every one H-1B employee because mm H-1B -hmm. employees are doing jobs that most Americans either can't or won't, as we've talked about already. And so if I'm an employer and I am sitting here going, I've got this very one-off IT job, one-off engineering job, one-off research scientist job, uh, anything yeah. that is a one-off and your time to fill is creeping up on more than 90 days and you're not getting any candidate flow and every staffing agency that reaches out to you about that requirement that has worked it comes back to you with feedback and saying, I, we can't find a US citizen or a green card holder. Are you willing to consider an H-1B your sponsor? And if your answer continues to be no, Mm. Then, then your job is going to continue to go unfilled wow. because you're looking for what we call purple squirrels and those <laughs> purple squirrels don't exist, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they're purple because they're not real, right? And so for mm -hmm. me, if, if I could give employers mm -hmm. advice, whether you're a tech startup, whether you're a large enterprise organization or anything in between, 
If mm -hmm. I'm looking at a position where my time to fill is over 90 days and the feedback that I continually get is that unless you're going to consider an H-1B visa employee, you're, this job is going to go unfilled, then you need to change what your policy is on sponsorship. Because wow. I can tell you that if you decide to sponsor an H-1B employee perm, whether that be through change of employer or you identify someone that's outside of the country and want to bring them in through the lottery, um, mm -hmm you're going to have a lot of value that's felt through that decision. And that value is going to improve uh, your organization's technology and your ability to innovate. And honestly, your ability to create more American jobs. That's a, uh, that's lovely. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I'm actually thinking back to mental health position, uh, positions that I was in and when we were trying to hire mental health professionals sometimes in very specific spaces uh, i have seen some positions go unfilled for more than a year correct and even though those employers were not subject to the cap like university systems that mm -hmm never struck them that, hey, maybe we need to consider H-1B sponsorship. That's right. And, and I think it, it goes back to they don't want to consider it because they don't understand it. And I think that that's where the H-1B guy and what I do for employers is such a big benefit because yeah. what I can help, what I do is I'm the glue. I advise them on how to do that, how to right. set that up, how to be compliant, how to have automation, transparency, and documentation that if I'm an employer and I have an H-1B on my staff and ICE walks through the door asking me, I am an open book. See what right. you want to see. Ask me everything. I've got it all right here. That's what I do. And I think that's a lot of mm -hmm. what a lot of people don't understand about what I do is that right. I help employers create recruitment strategies and recruitment programs, not only for talent that's already here in the US, but for global talent and pipelining yeah. that. And so, you know, as as I grow, that that word has gotten out. And I could tell right. you that a lot of my clients, you know what they're most concerned about, Dr. G? They're Dr. most G. concerned about fake candidates. Okay. Oh, and, <laughs> and, and, and I can tell you the reason is, is that there has been for years the gaming of the system that has gone on, right? Specifically in staffing of IT jobs. And so uh, that's where a lot of the negativity comes towards H-1Bs and a lot of the hatred yeah. because that has gone on in these smaller mom and pop middlemen, as we refer to, third party right. vendors that are out there. It's not the mid to large third party vendors that are doing this for the most part. It's the guy in somebody's basement whose cousin is out there pushing resumes on staffing firms that's that's yeah. doing that. And so if I'm an employer, what I want to do is make sure that one, I'm open to considering all of the available talent. And two, right. if I am going to do that, and as you say, that's why I use 90 days, because there are some jobs that you look at how long have they been open and it's over 365. It's pretty horrifying, right? And but if you use 90 days, that's three months. If internally my internal talent acquisition or externally my staffing firm partners, the constant feedback that I'm getting either internally or from my external staffing firm partners comes back and says, listen, I know you want to hire a perm candidate. Um, the only way you're going to hire that perm candidate is if you sponsor Right. And if you're not open to that, then that position is just going to sit and rot. And that goes yeah. back to, to the million open job postings in February 2020, where there yeah. are a lot of those positions where employers aren't willing to sponsor that are just sitting there open and inflating mm -hmm. numbers in a very, very strange manner. Because yeah. when you look at unemployment, again, for IT is less than 4%. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's... Uh, yeah, I'm really glad you're doing the work that you're doing because I, I know after you and I connected, I've I've been thinking about ways to, and of course, you know, we can talk more about it uh, offline, but there is, especially in the mental health field, there is just so much desire for mental health professionals who have uh, some global knowledge because there are communities that benefit from uh immigrant mental health professionals, but because those agencies actually don't know how the H-1B system works, they're just mm -hmm. like, oh, 
I don't think we can do this. And I'm just like, oh, you know, there's this guy called the H1B guy who would be such a great resource. They're so, just afraid. They're afraid of the unknown. They're afraid of the legal ramifications. And so that's, that's why you have to have a defined process. You've got to have great yeah. immigration legal counsel um, mm -hmm. that, that, that you have on retainer. And because mm -hmm. I don't do that, that's not what I do. Oh. I, I advise and help you as an employer avoid risk. Yeah. And fill jobs yeah. that otherwise would go unfilled. That's that's my my niche. Beautiful. So. Yeah. And I think just as a mental health professional, a lot of things that I often say is like we need to find ways to replace fear with facts. Yep. And I think that's where uh, the work that you're doing is just so important because you're helping replace the fear of the unknown with facts. Mm -hmm. Like it's right. not as unknown as that. Like, that's here, right. Here's how it works. So exactly. that's awesome. Thank you. And the second question I had was actually about, I think, I recognize you as an ally to uh, the you know immigrant professional community, and I'm curious about how being an ally has changed you. Like, mm -hmm. what are things that you've noticed um, changing? Whether they're even uh, even human qualities that you've noticed have become deeper because yeah. of the work you've done as an ally. I think that's a, a great question because I think about how fulfilled in my day-to-day -day kind of career of the H1B guy that, that I am. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, when I look back on it, everything that I've done prior experience wise led me to this decision in, mm -hmm. in June of 2020. I didn't know it at the time, uh, yeah. but, but what I realized is I had a never again moment. And that never again moment was, am I going to do something for somebody that I don't want to do? And, mm -hmm. and what it made me also realize is that my skill set is very unique. And that, that uniqueness allows me to be a disruptor. And a, a disruptor in the sense that that's the way we've always done it isn't good enough anymore mm -hmm. and, and and staffing we have to be creative and so you know mm -hmm. as a recruiter i'm always thought of okay what can i do to attract top talent how can i get this person to reply back to me how am i use my wit my creativity to to do that but the question is about being an an ally and i think for me um you know ultimately what i wanted to do as part of the h1b guy platform is is bring awareness to you know the h1b uh visa as a whole help mm -hmm. educate individuals on the h1b visa and, and why it's important for filling high-tech mm -hmm. high-skilled jobs here in the us um but i also wanted to help bring awareness um to to equality because i could tell you i've befriended several h1b visa holders over the years and you know their contributions um, to society versus mine are, are, aren't that entirely different. Um, mm -hmm. But the stress of them getting a driver's license or renewing their driver's license versus mine, two totally different uh, you know mm -hmm. avenues and 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 things altogether. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for me, it, it came back to uh, this S Senate Bill three eighty six mm -hmm. and. You know the that equality aspect of it, and I know there was a lot of mm -hmm. folks out there, detractors of it, uh, a lot of a lot of hate towards it. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, we have this problem in terms of the backlog that's been created, and mm -hmm. that backlog was created through the H one B, and the fact that seventy percent of H one B holders are from India, and the other eighteen percent are from China. Well, who are the two mm -hmm. countries most impacted by the green card backlog? Because there's mm -hmm. a seven percent quota on, on country caps, and so mm -hmm. it went from I'm going to educate and bring awareness on the H1B visa to ultimately I have a much larger platform than just yeah. that, right? Yeah. And, and so, in terms of fulfillment of of my career, I mean, I'm just getting started. But what I've done mm -hmm. in you know the first 10 months here almost wow. um, it has it, it's gone by so fast but what but right. what I've done in the first 10 months and I look back Dr. G to where I was mentally at this point in time last year mm. and and it was not a good place yeah. um, 
you know, the, the fact is we were kind of a month into quarantining here at, at, at this point. Um, you know, my employer was, was being hit very hard by the pandemic um, and the stress and anxiety that that created because I've been in staffing a long time. I'm, I'm no dummy. I know what, what that meant for me personally. And inevitably, you know, at the end of May, it, it became reality. And it almost was this relief, though. And that relief was that um, never again. And, yeah. you know, while, while I've looked for other jobs and other opportunities while I've been doing this, I've not found something that's the right fit for me or for, for that employer. And so what I realized mm -hmm. is that this is my career now. And um, I'm I'm going to continue to to try to make it that right and, yeah. and do my best to to plant seeds every day, and uh, you know hope that 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 I can build a loyal customer base um, and individuals that not only want to listen to me talk on YouTube but also want to go to the h1bguy.com. Right. And it's interesting because in the last three days on the website are the most views that I've had daily totals in the last three days. Why wow. is why is that? Well, a lot of it comes back to, as you talked about, um, the October Visa Bulletin of 2020 and, wow. you know, the, 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 uh, the ant mound that it stirred up and the craziness yeah. that it created. Well, you know, when you've got, um, uh, you know, chats with Charlie going on and him talking about more spillover into next year, people are crazy about trying to calculate where they are in, in their dates right now. And so yeah. I'm going to keep talking about it. I'm going to keep writing about it. Uh, I'm going to keep trying to get those. I, I hate to say predictions because they're forecasts, but I'm going to keep trying to help educate um, and do my mm -hmm. best to give individuals a different uh, opinion and a different different take on that and so you know yeah. really just appreciate that question because you know for me um everyone in in terms of of what we do here is has right. been been so supportive um you know again there's I'm always so a, a negative voice here and there but you know that's just that's the nature of of, of humanity so absolutely absolutely and i absolutely give kudos to you for doing that because i know how hard um it can be when you set out to do one thing and then it ends up being bigger and yeah. recognizing that we don't want the h1b system to become like a ticket to indentured servitude right. nobody wants that and a lot of immigrants don't realize it can become that and so changing uh and i think so using your platform to actually ally with the the bigger universe in that mm -hmm. sense that h1b needs to be like a clean system that doesn't become a ticket to indentured servitude and then you know talking more about equality and immigration laws That's right we give so much kudos to you for uh you know taking that plunge falling down that yeah. rabbit hole and not you know not backing away and just going like okay i'm gonna keep going <laughs> i'm gonna keep doing yeah. this yeah. No. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we had a couple of questions. They're not really relevant to uh, the mental health. It's a lot about adjustment of status and um, the H-1B lottery. I'm going to take just like two minutes if you're OK with it and just oh, yeah. ad ad address them very quickly uh, because we're, we're coming up on on well over an hour here. So um, pretty uh, she had. I had told her to, to contact me directly, but I'm just going to take a stab at it, which is ultimately uh, she asked if she could send in her medicals herself. I believe that she can, but I would advise her to go through her attorney if that would be possible. Um, Data is from India, but living in Kuwait as an architect and structural design engineer. He's got an offer here in the U.S., but wasn't selected in the lottery. He's asking about the H-2B uh, visa. Unfortunately, you're a high skilled immigrant. Um, you'd have to consider specialty occupation as a, a, a architect and structural design engineer. So H H2 is not going to be an option for you. Um, and then uh, Argya Tosh is asking about perm labor for two different locations. Um, if you're working in a different location, I believe um, you would need to have an amendment to the perm. Um, you should and probably need to use an updated I-140 because that's based on the physical location. 
Um, I would reach out to your immigration attorney and clarify that though, or your employer's immigration attorney, they should be able to help you. But if you're working in a different location than your previously certified perm, that's considered a material change um, from an employer perspective. So you, you would most likely need to have a, a recertification there. Um, and then the last one, uh, Dr. G, uh, Regul is asking about um, he was selected in the lottery, but his degree is a non-computer related degree, um, and it's for a computer analyst H-1B visa. So he's asking if he submits a paper petition, if his degree is not a CS degree, will it be an issue? It could possibly, um, but the biggest thing is that the job requirements from your employer need to designate the degree type. And if the degree that you have aligns with that, then you should be okay but definitely some, some cause for concern there. So thank you for letting me run through those really quickly. Um, I, I appreciate that uh, a whole lot. You know, I, um, before we wrap up, I just want to give you uh, an opportunity here. Um, you know, anything that, that you wanted to leave uh, the audience with before we wrap up here today? Um, there's this, so. Uh... Yeah, and I think I say this both as a, as a therapist as well as a immigration reform, um, an advocate for immigration, uh, bipartisan immigration reform. Uh, it's just make sure that you remember that uh, you're part of a larger universe and keep advocating for yourself um, and advocating for the larger community. And you'll recognize that there's a lot of uh, beauty and mental health that comes mm -hmm. from connection and being part of a cause. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage people to continue to advocate mm -hmm. for themselves and have their voices be heard. Yeah, be more than a keyboard warrior, right? I think yes. it, it is the point there, right? <laughs> I mean, that's it, you know, that it's, it's easy yeah. to, to do that, but it's, it's harder to, to be out there, you know, physically moving, moving boulders. So, Absolutely. yes. Well, I wanted, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, today's live stream was brought to you by RecruiterNetworks.com, the smart solution for digital perm ads since 2001. This national job board network provides recruitment websites in 1,024 major U.S. metro areas. Each local job board is its own portal and is a low-cost resource for immigration recruitment ads for all industries and professions with a flat price of $225 per ad regardless of which city you choose. RecruiterNetworks.com has been the the number one place for immigration attorneys, immigration ad agencies, and employers to meet the DOL requirements for the digital portion of the PERM advertisement rules. RecruiterNetworks.com. Tell them the H-1B guy sent you. And also, this live stream was brought to you by Path to Canada. Path to Canada provides a plan B for high-skilled immigrants currently in the U.S. whose status may be uncertain. If you're facing an H-1B denial or OPT expiration, don't get caught off guard. Make sure you have a plan B. Path to Canada is your answer and will help you navigate the process. If you're interested in finding out more, there's a link in the video description below. Dr. G, I just want to say one last time, thank you for coming on, for telling your story. Again, it's anchor.fm forward slash five wellness minutes. Go check out her podcast. And, uh, you know, I just wish you a great afternoon and uh, look forward to uh, what's next for you and I, because I know we're, we're not done here. So... <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much, Robert, for having me. This was fun. Absolutely. I just wanted to ask you one last time to please like this video, subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube, and click the bell for notifications so that you're notified anytime we go live like we did here today at 2 p.m. Eastern or that we post new content to this channel. If you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to watch this stream. We really appreciate your support. I'm Robert. I'm the H-1B guy, your global source.